they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What inspiring vision of what it meant to be the first gatherings of the first Christians. Thank you, Simone. Isn't it great to have Simone back? Yeah. Yeah. Back. Thank you, Simone. Uh, and the title of our lesson today is simply Together. When you read this passage, the thing that hits me is it's just togetherness. Togetherness on lots of levels. And that's a wonderful thing to enjoy when you are like-minded with the people you are together with. And that's a lot of what Christmas is meant to be about, isn't it? That sense of togetherness with people you want to be together with. By the time you've spent four or five days with your relatives, you're not quite sure if you want to stay together with them much longer, but there is, there is some joy of a few hours or days together. I'll enjoy uh, that togetherness. And there's a special time of year. And I do think, although dates and times on some level are artificial, in another sense, God seems to have built rhythms and seasons into our lives and our, our world. And this is one of those times of year, I believe, it's worth taking time to reflect, to refresh, and sort of restock your convictions so we can move forward with purpose. So just before Christmas, I did something I do every year, which is to take what I call a Sabbath day, to go away and pray and read and think about the, my life. And so I went to somewhere in Bedfordshire, up on a high hill, where I was sure I would see great views over the English countryside. <laughs> and that is all I could see. Uh, I could see a few birds and sheep uh, and, and the fog. Uh, but I had a great time last week just out in the wild, just praying and thinking and then going to uh, a place where I could sit down and write down reflections on the year and then thoughts about the year ahead. But that's a, a helpful thing sometimes to do. Uh, most of you here know that my mother died earlier last year. And so part of the uh, time I spent this year was to go and visit my uh, family in Kent and the graveside uh, for my mother there. And it was good to do that. It was uh, not the easiest Christmas in some respects, being the first Christmas without my mother. And uh, some of us here, like George, can, can relate to the idea of having lost someone, Stefan and others. And uh, our prayers are with Tunde and the family uh, as Tunde's lost his father. It, these things are meaningful, but have their challenges. And so... It's important to mark these things, um, but uh, so it was good to do that down there. And I spent time down there with, I was flipping around where I go forward one. There we are. Uh, so on the right, uh, Penny and my daughter Lydia and my father were very brave this Christmas because they let me cook. Uh, so that was our Christmas lunch uh, together on the right and on the left. Uh, this last week, uh, we went to visit my uncle, who lives in Essex. We took the family, various bits of the family all met up in a pub in Essex uh, uh, for a Christmas lunch from my uncle who can't travel. And so um, I really appreciate a friend of mine uh, posting about the fact that uh, my father looks so young. I think the, on the left there, the thing is it means that I must uh, look quite old, I think. I, I, I'm not quite sure how this all works. But... It is uh, it's wonderful to have a special time of year to get refreshed. That's what I want to talk about today is about how togetherness in Christ refreshes us. And I pray that we'll be uh, refreshed by that. Now, question for you. So do you know what January is named after? Do you know why January is called January? Yes, we have a, a, someone at the back. Janus. Okay. The Roman God who had two faces. Janus, yeah? And I need my water. So the idea is he faces forwards and faces back. The two faces, so backwards and forwards, of January looking back on the year just gone and looking towards the year ahead. 
it's probably not a good thing to be two-faced, but this idea of looking back and looking forward is deeply embedded in our, in our culture. Um, I rather like the way that uh, Judaism deals with the end of their year and the beginning of their new year. If you don't know about this, uh, the Jewish new year is not at this time of year. Uh, it's in the autumn, and it's known as Rosh Hashanah. And it's celebrated for 10 days. They take 10 days to think about the past year and to think about the coming year. And those first 10 days of the new year, so we, in a sense we'd be in this phase now, that for those first 10 days of the new year are set aside for what they call internal cleansing. Internal cleansing. That's not, that's not something physical. That, that's, that's spiritual. Seeking God's forgiveness for, uh, for the wrongs committed in the past 12 months. And also asking God for the spiritual strength for the challenges that are coming. And let's face it, there are challenges coming, aren't there? We're aware of that. And they call that 10-day period the days of awe. Days of awe. Days to stop and be in awe of God. In awe of what he's done and in awe of what he can do in strengthening us for the future. And I really like that idea. And I wonder whether we could just designate this week and maybe next week for us as a church as days of awe. The beginning of the year to worship God to ask him to fill us with strength, to to help us be grateful for what he's done and give us the strength for the year ahead. And so with all that in mind, that's why I want to look at the the early church here as we uh, look at this passage here in Acts chapter 2. Now, before we talk in more detail about the verses 42 to 47, we should just put the context here what's going on. So in Acts chapter 2, Jesus has resurrected. He's given the Holy Spirit to his apostles and Peter stood up and preached what you could call the first Christian sermon. And he's preached, and at the end of his lesson, he says this to the 3,000 people that are gathered there on the birthday of the church, you could say. He says, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, by the way, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they said to Peter and the other apostles, "Uh, brothers, what should we do since this new reality has been revealed to us? And Peter tells them, repent. Repent and be baptized for uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That must imply any of us here today as well. And uh, with many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So this is the context for what happens now with this, these newly gathered people, with newly gathered, with new convictions, new understanding, a new identity in Christ. What have they understood? They've understood that Jesus is Lord and Messiah, that he is king, that the king has come, and it's time for them to submit to that king. This king is providing, offering forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's why they repent. In other words, turning from one set of beliefs and understandings and way of life to a completely different way of understanding and believing and living. And so they make that decision. And having made that decision, they are baptized into Christ. And the word there is baptizo, which is immersion. So they are immersed in Christ, probably in one of the many mikveh bathing, uh, the purification pools that were by the temple there. So they're all, and there are lots of them. So you think 3,000 people being baptized in one day is fanciful? Well, if we were to open this baptistry in the stage here and do 3,000 in a day, it'd be a long day. Uh, It would. But around the temple, you've got lots of these uh, purification pools. It would be very easy for the 12 apostles to to crack on and baptize 3,000 people in not too short a time. So here you have 3,000 dripping wet people with a, a completely changed mind about who they are, who God is, what God is doing, who Jesus, oh, he got crucified, and it's our fault, oh dear. And all of this has now blown their circuits, and you could forgive them for being rather confused, because most of them had never heard Jesus. Maybe a few in that 3,000 had, but most of them would not have heard his teaching, not have, ex- uh, have experienced his presence or, um, or seen his life. So what do they do? How do they now live? How do they exist? And you'll notice that I'm trying to avoid the word church in this lesson, because although this is the church, it doesn't use the word church here. 
and I think that's it's helpful sometimes to not think about words that have lots of accru accumulated extra meaning. What are we looking at here? We're looking at people whose lives have been transformed by coming to know Jesus, and then how did they live and why? And as I now talk about a few things briefly about the nature of the early Christian gatherings, fellowship, congregation, as we do that, I hope and pray this isn't something I really, really don't want this to be a lesson about the early church did this, so we should do this. It's, it's, it's not, that's not the point. It's about the way that Jesus changed them, led them to this. So it's really this is a lesson about Jesus. What happens when Jesus changes lives and people gather together to be together in him? So with that in mind, let's, um, let's talk about a few brief things that we see here. We'll come to Kononoia in just a moment. But first of all, the apostles' teaching. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching or the apostles in the act of teaching would be a more wordy but more accurate translation. So they sat there listening to the apostles. So not, they weren't just having a personal, what we call a quiet time or a personal devotional, listening to a devotional podcast or just reading the Bible on our own, all of which are fine things to do. But they were gathered together to learn together. I think that's something for us to reflect on. When we gather like this, or when we gather in other groups, whether in our homes or wherever, or even online, one of the reasons we gather is to learn together. There is something about learning together that enhances the learning experience. And all the teachers in the congregation will say amen to that. Because when you learn together, you learn things you wouldn't have learned by learning on your own. Other people have insights, other people have ideas, or other people have perspectives. If I'm sitting in a room with people older and younger than me, with people from different cultures and countries than me, different racial backgrounds than me, and we're talking about a topic, I learn 10 times more than I learn on my own. So this is why it's important that God's people gather to learn together. And it's also why it's important that we share our learning with one another. As much as I think there's a place for a lesson like this, this cannot be the only way we learn. This, in fact, should be a one part of how we learn as we learn together and from one another, sharing what we're reading, sharing what God is teaching us, sharing how God's word is becoming real to us, how, the, how Jesus is becoming real to us in our lives. These apostles did this because, uh, and did all this teaching because the people they were with hadn't seen Jesus, hadn't heard him teach, most of them, and didn't really know. And so they passed it on. I think it's remarkable that they were able to do this like this, day after day, teaching and teaching and teaching, presumably answering questions. Because a lot of the way teaching was done in that culture was people would ask questions and then you might ask the questioner a question and they might ask a question of the questioner's question. And you'd, 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 you'd learn as you went along uh, like that. And that's what they did. I just want to encourage myself and all of us to be people who enjoy learning together and who talk to one another about what we're learning. It will deeply enrich all of us if we learn together. They were a Bible-focused group in a sense, although they had no Bible uh, in the way we understand it at the time. But they did that because they wanted to learn about Jesus. And that's what drives our learning. I want to learn more about Jesus. If that was the only resolution for 2022, God, teach me more about your son, that would be a good resolution. Let's talk about uh, koinonia. The, uh, the word there for fellowship, translated fellowship here, they were devoted to the fellowship. Um, fellowship, gathering, it has many meanings. It can mean fellowship, it can be translated participation, society, it can even be translated sexual alliance, partnership, communion, not, not the Lord's Supper communion, but being in communion, um, aiding, uh, as in contribution in aid, helping people with monetary or what, uh, other things that will help them, sharing, uh, it can mean all of these things. And this is what they were doing. So, what this doesn't mean it's probably easier to say, it's shorter anyway. What it doesn't mean is it doesn't mean they came along on a Sunday morning, saw someone they knew, gave them a hug, said hello, and then went home again. That's not what this is talking about. Fellowship is a participation. It is, I like the word participation. I like the word in their um, partnership. Uh, th this, I think, expresses it to me. When Christians gather under Christ, we do it to partner together in, in growing. We do it together to participate together in what God is doing in this, in this body. And that's why we're here. And that's why we gather outside of a Sunday morning. 
We do it so that we can continue to grow and learn uh, together. It also conveys the idea of eating together, which is also mentioned uh, in this passage. Eating together as well. Uh, the word also, it comes from the word meaning common, and we see that they have everything in common in this passage. And that's not to say that communism is a political a reality we should be imitating, because what they did, they did that to meet specific needs. So it wasn't a political um, doctrine. It was a practical way to make sure that no one was needy if, if that need could be met by the community. Having things in common. Here's the thing that arises from that. We can't practice that unless we know each other's needs. So there's a certain level of vulnerability which is vital to Christian, true Christian fellowship. By vulnerability, I don't mean um, sharing everything with everybody every time you meet them and just pour it, you know, like, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about here. There are some things that depends on the context of who you're talking to about what you might say to them, but it does mean not hiding things, not shutting things away in a cupboard and saying, well, you know, that's not very important. We, we, we got to be, there's a phrase some people use about this kind of thing, doing life together doing life together, not doing just singing together, good as that is, not just doing being here together, though that's good, doing life together. That's fellowship. That's Christian fellowship because that is how Jesus was with his followers. They followed him, walked with him, did life together. We see that emphasized a lot more in the rest of the New Testament. So I would like to encourage myself and all of us to think about how can we here do more life together? Especially, I might say, between our two congregations, getting to know each other better. The Watford Church of Christ, the West Watford Church, how can we, how can we do more life together? Perhaps we could, in our time of fellowship, as we call it, after the service, we could sit down or chat and get the diaries open and see whether we could meet up and have a coffee or have a bite to eat or go out and pray or even just get on the phone to one another. But how could we do that kind of, of fellowship? so that we participate in the Christian life together. Um, I like this quote from Chrysostom. He was one of the early church writers and fathers. He was in Constantinople. He was an interesting character who spoke out against the abuses of authority in the church, perpetrated by leaders and by members. Um, but anyway, he wrote this about this passage. He said, this was an angelic commonwealth, not to call anything of theirs their own, Forthwith, the root of evils was cut out. None reproached, none envied, none grudged, no pride, no contempt was there. The poor man knew no shame, the rich no haughtiness. No haughtiness here, people. <laughs> I love the language. It's a vision, isn't it? It's a vision of that, not, not a perfection. The early church was not perfect. It's not a vision of perfection. It's, it's a vision of something that only God can create. But as he creates it, it is up to us to participate in it with what we have as we, as we can. So fellowship. Um, yes, one scripture I'd like to share is from Malachi. I'm just jumping around. Go to that one. There we go. Malachi 3. The prophet Malachi has a good go at the people of Israel. You can read it later. And at the end of his challenges to the people of Israel who were not behaving in the way that the people of Israel should, it says this, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other. I just love that phrase. They heard from God and then they talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. And there's something about that, that one of the reasons we learn to, as we learn together is we talk to each other about what we're learning and the Lord listens to us, to us in our needs. So I would suggest that this is a good time uh, to get to know each other better and to bear in mind something we all know, but we must live by, is that seeing each other on a Sunday morning is not what it's all about. It's part of it, but it's much more than that. It's about doing life together. The breaking of bread. Um, this is jumping around. Never mind. I'll leave it there. The breaking of bread, it, they're devoted to this. This is almost certainly the Lord's Supper, as we would call it. Um, it could refer to eating in homes, meals, and that kind of thing as well. But the fact that it's singled out like this and named like this, it is the phrase that Luke tends to use in Acts and in his gospel for the Lord's Supper. So it's the Lord's Supper. It was very important to the early church. It's important that we take communion, as we call it, regularly. 
and that we do it in a way that honours God. And I would suggest this, I wonder whether we might want to do um, impromptu and informal communions together from time to time. Not just on Sunday morning. And nowhere in the Bible does it say you can't have communion except on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. It's just not there. And when you look at the way that Jesus dealt with the two people on the road to Emmaus, and go back and have a look at that at the end of Luke's Gospel, that wasn't on a normal, regular church service situation. That's a kind of Lord's Supper. It certainly happened on Sundays. We're sure of that from the book of Acts. But why should it be restricted to that? How, why not have a little gathering where two families come together and do, have a communion together, have a Lord's Supper together? Maybe it's something we could expand on, experiment with, because it's such a special thing to be able to remember what Jesus did for us. The breaking of bread and prayer. Prayer here is more, probably more accurately translated the prayer or the prayers. It is plural. And that's because it's communal. This is congregational prayer. It's not personal. There's plenty of personal prayer. But this is about congregational prayer. Or if you like, people coming together to pray. Uh, in the book of Acts, we see prayer mentioned so many times. And that's a fruitful Bible study, is to look up the word prayer in the book of Acts and see the way in which the early church and early Christians prayed. I won't go into that right now in more detail, but again, I'd like to encourage us all to pray more together. Whether it's two people, ten people, or all of us. I think it would be a good thing to do. And maybe, like me, you might want to think about taking what I call a Sabbath day. Take a morning to go off and pray. Uh, if, you're, if you've got young children, perhaps you can swap children halfway through the day. and uh, I mean, swap your own children with each other, not swap them for other children. <laughs> but just... Swap part way through. Perhaps one of you takes the morning and one takes the afternoon. Just go if you want ideas. I've been doing this for several years, then I'm happy to share that with you. But how about some special time in prayer, maybe with somebody else? Days of awe. Days of awe. Let's have some days of awe. I want to read now a paragraph from a book by Michael Green called Evangelism in the Early Church. The impact of this. Motley crew in Acts 2. He said it was a small group whom Jesus commissioned to carry on his work and to bring the gospel to the whole world. They were not distinguished. They were not well educated. They had no influential backers. In their own nation, they were nobodies. And in any case, their own nation was a mere second class province on the eastern extremity of the Roman map. If they had stopped to weigh up the probabilities of succeeding in their mission, he even granted their conviction that Jesus was alive and that his spirit went with them to equip them for the task. Their hearts must surely have sunk. So heavily were they weighted against them. How could they possibly succeed? And yet, they did. This inconsequential, not particularly gifted group of people in an unfashionable part of the world, in an oppressed nation, went on to change history. It's because of Jesus, and it's because of what Jesus had done to them and for them, galvanized them into a together life that the world had never seen before and has never seen the like since. There is nothing like the local church. There's nothing in the world like it. There's no society, there's no club, there's no other organization that is like the early church, like the, the gospel-inspired church when it lives together. The danger to the church is not generally false teaching. That's a problem, but that's not really the major problem. The major issue for church's survival and healthiness is whether one another, we will devote ourselves to one another under Christ. If we do that, God will sort out all the bumps and wrinkles and challenges that come along. It's our call to be devoted to the right things. May I challenge myself and all of us here to devote ourselves to the right things this year. Let's devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Let's devote ourselves to the fellowship. Let's devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. Let's devote ourselves to the prayers. And let's see if what God will do is not what he did then. Adding to their number daily those who are being saved. Creating awe among people who saw this. I'm going to conclude with uh, reading a prayer. And then I think it's Ava's going to come up and pray for us. Is that right? Yes, Ava. Good. Before we take bread and wine. But let me say one more thing before I come to that last bit. 
This is why I want, us to, I want to cancel our normal Wednesday night meetings in January. I want to create space for us to take initiative to go and gather with somebody else and find somebody, maybe two or three people, to meet with a couple of times this month to practice at least one of these four things. The apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. You could do all four if you like, but do at least one. Twice this month, I would like to encourage us and challenge us to find somebody to do these with. Twice in the month of January. We'll see about February. But let's do that this month. And if you have got, you feel like you don't know people enough and you don't know who to chat to meet up with, come and chat to me and we'll figure something out. We can work that out. But let's do something different this month. Days of all. I came across this prayer um, recently. And it's the one that the Methodists use at their renewal service they have every year. And I rather liked it, and I didn't like it. Because I liked it because it's pretty powerful. And I didn't like it because it's quite challenging. Let's read it together. The Methodist Covenant Prayer. I am no longer... Are you going to say it together? Oh, okay. Did I? Actually, the whole title of the sermon is Together, isn't it? Okay. Good point. Good point. Okay. Missed something there. Okay. Now let's say it together. All right. Let's say it together. Right. The Methodist Covenant Prayer. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Let it be so. Let us be devoted. Let us see God work. What an exciting year we have ahead of us. I'm going to ask Ava to come and pray, and then we'll take bread and wine, which will remind us of what Jesus did, and strengthen us for his work that he's got in mind for us this week.